respected seniors colleagues and juniors a very good morning to the first galaxy of intellectuals gathered on this out online platform i welcome you all on this pleasant morning of 21st august 2020 to this parasitology webinar series on strategic sustainable control of parasitic diseases of livestock poultry wildlife and their political significance covid-19 pandemic represents a massive global health crisis but even in this time zone of crisis the flow of knowledge must continue and for the effective flow of knowledge in the field of veterinary parasitology department of veterinary parasitology college of veterinary sciences lala laspatra university of veterinary and animal science is organizing this 3 days webinar series with speakers from reputed organizations and hope that this webinar would provide a constructive platform to address the desired objectives we are quite confident that the webinar will surely facilitate the enthusiastic uh, participants to bridge the gap of knowledge and thereby providing workable solutions for strategic management of parasites of livestock i thank you all from the bottom of our heart for registering in this webinar series and in order to make it a grand success i humbly request all the participants to follow some of the discipline we request everyone to mute the mic to avoid background noise that may distract you from listening to the webinar if you have any question from the speaker please type it in the chat box and we will be answering the question at the end of this session now i request our head of the department dr subdi bhora veterinary parasitology lala lajpat university of veterinary animal science please share his valuable innovative and scintillating views about the department and its glorious past and bright future ahead dr bhora is a very distinguished parasitologist and one of the youngest hod of our country dr bhora sir please over to bhora sir good morning all of the all of the participants myself dr sukdeep bora welcome you all to this national webinar series at the department of veterinary parasitology college of veterinary science lala lajpat rai university of veterinary and animal sciences isar it is a matter of great pleasure for me to welcome you all participants to this national webinar series on strategies for sustainable control of parasites of livestock poultry and wildlife and their public health significance to be held from 21st to 23rd august 2020 through online platform first i would like to thanks our worthy vice chancellor dr gurdyaal singh whose vision has shown us the way for the present webinar i would thanks our dr divakar sharma for his support i will take this opportunity to thanks our mentor and senior parasitologist from controller of examination dr sridhar gupta whose guidance and support helped us to reach this platform during this webinar we will discuss about the different aspects of sustainable control of parasites in various animal hosts but before the start of webinar i would like to give a brief of this department of veterinary parasitology duvas hisar now the department Uh, the, the, uh, the department is organizing this national webinar series this national webinar series 2020 on sustainable on the strategies for sustainable control of parasites of livestock poultry and wildlife and their public health significance from 21st to 23rd august 2020 coming department Dr. Dr. Karam, the founder of it, joined the department on 8th November 1949 from the state public service. Public services. Stayed as the head of department for around 20 years, and during that period, many stalwarts like Dr. N. S. Mitra, Dr. P. D. Malik. 
डॉक्टर डी पी बनर्जी डॉक्टर आर पी गुप्ता डॉक्टर एन पी छाबड़ा एंड डॉक्टर एस के गुप्ता दे वर दी हेड ऑफ डिपार्टमेंट ऑन दिस ऑफ दिस स्टीजियस डिपार्टमेंट ड्यूरिंग दी पीरियड ऑफ डॉक्टर करमचंद मलिक दी पी जी प्रोग्राम वॉज ऑफ स्टार्टेड ड्यूरिंग नाइनटीन सिक्सटी टू एंड फूड थिंग इज एक्सियम नंबर ऑफ आई रिकवरिंग इन दी कमिंग स्लाइड ऑल्सो पोस्ट ग्रेजुएट स्टूडेंट्स पास आउट फ्रॉम एनी अदर वेटनरी कॉलेज In addition to the veterinary college, little department of parasitological research station at Karnal was also established in 1965. Nowadays, the department has been shifted to the veterinary clinics. Uh, presently, if we talk about the department, has five faculties: myself, Dr. Sudeep Bora, Dr. B. R. Maharana, Dr. Snehal Gupta, Dr. Anil Kumar Nehra, as well as Dr. Anuman or Anuman Dev Mukti. the history of the department reveals the department has a unique contribution of conducting three consecutive three national congress of ia of ia vp one in 1980 when even the association was not formed followed by 1996 and lastly in 2010 in addition to these three national congress we have also conducted one all india seminar Uh, granted by uh, the UGC in October 1983. Uh, the department has uh, laurels of winning many awards, as well as honors. Few of them, namely, as Dr. B. N. Singh Memorial Recognition Award, Dr. Rajinder Pal Singh Gold Medal, Dr. Uh, Rohala Nehru Award, Dr. Manuja Award, uh, Dr. D. P. Banerjee Award, etc., etc. the major research uh, projects carried out by the department is that we have carried out 10 research projects for, uh, funded by the dbt dst by the private agencies by the state agencies as well as by the rashtri krishi vigyan uh, the mentors has published eight books uh, uh, in the uh, uh, by the different publishers but nowadays also the science we have we still have nowadays presently the faculty they also have published five new books in addition to what are being displayed here the department taken lead role in conducting research especially on enthermetic resistance in nematodes vector borne hemoparasite diseases gis and remote sensing of parasitic diseases molecular characterization of bovine coccidiosis coccidian oocysts and senate about department is also having a non planned research team in which one post of senior scientist is also running in the department the department has over 1000 research publications which also includes many of the national international published in uh, international publications many reviews as well as uh, many other research articles the contribution of the department in standardization of the process of thalaria annulator attenuated microsurgeons is worth mention the contribution of dr uh, railu during his uh, phd work in developing or in developing the monoclonal based and antibody based trypanosomiasis uh, virus latex agglutination test is worth mentioning the test which can diagnose the lydia uh, trypanosomiasis virus in all the animals irrespective of the department is also Created with molecular characterization of bovine coccidian oocyst, as well as phylogenetic phylogenetic characterization of bovine Cetaria digitata. This all led to 68 MBC students and 18 PhD degrees. Lastly, I would like to. thanks my department colleagues as well as the 24/7 service rendered by our technical expert dr nisha thank you thank you dr bora sir we could not think of starting this event without the blessing of our elderly and respected parasitologist who pioneered the work we are taking forward one of the stalwart is dr j r rao we feel honored to introduce dr j r rao sir dr j r rao former principal scientist and hod 
pharmaceutical division i sir i bhr i is the former officer in charge i bhr i ipr cell management former consultant of icr nan hyderabad for post graduate diploma in technology management in agriculture former emeritus scientist icr nan he has, uh, he has 37 years of research and more than 22 years of teaching experience at pgilet he has acted as a major guide for 3 mbc and 5 phd students in veterinary parasitology and 5 mbc in veterinary biotechnology and as co guide for more than 15 students he has gained so many awards fellowship and recognition he is the fao fellow university of illinois us in 1990 fellow national academy of veterinary science fellow indian association for advancement of veterinary parasitology editor in chief journal of veterinary parasitology there are so many awards to his credit jawaharlal nehru award for outstanding phd thesis dr jati dubey young scientist award ivr best teacher award dr v s alwar memorial award in 2001 for the best article in immunoparasitology best research article dr eswaran gold medal by the indian veterinary association chief editor self study report for icr ivr for the year 2002 to 2003 he has published more than 180 research papers in national and international journals he is the co-author of the publication 100 years of agriculture science in india he has received a patent grant as well as two patent applications are awaiting for grant he has many important professional and uh, professional contributions he has developed so many technologies He is the member of various national level committees. Currently, he is acting as research of advisory committee of ICR Institute of NRC on methane. So, with this, let's begin the winner series with our first distinguished speaker, Dr. N. D. Singla sir. We feel privileged to introduce Dr. L. D. Singla sir. Dr. Dr. L. D. Singla is presently serving in second tenure as professor cum head since October 30, 2017. He was conferred M. S. Radha Medal in 2001, Dr. B. B. Rao Medal in 2002, and Sikshya Ratan Puraskar in 2009 for his meritorious services, outstanding performance, and remarkable role in education and research in the field of veterinary parasitology. He was our prestigious Dr. B. B. Banerji Memorial Memorial Oration Award 2013 and Simhat Nishamani Parija Oration Award 2014. of indian association for the advancement of veterinary parasitology in the recognition of his valuable contributions and achievements in the field of veterinary parasitology and parasitic zoonosis respectively dr singla is a fellow of national academy of veterinary science royal society of tropical medicine and hygiene and advancement of veterinary parasitology he bears international funding on a competitive basis from various national and international agencies like commonwealth science council Bill and Melinda Foundation, Minister of Foreign Affairs, France, etc., as well as WAAP, for attending advanced training and scientific meetings in more than 15 countries. Besides being the editor board of more than 20 internationally reputed journals, he is the serving as associate chief editor, academic editor, regional editor, and associate editor of journals of international repute. He has supervised 45 postgraduate students as major, co-major, and as member of advisory committee. He successfully guided the government of India sponsored visiting scientists from Sudan, Guinea, and Egypt. He has published more than 200 papers in journals of national and international repute. He is willing to work tirelessly for promotion of the discipline of veterinary science through encouraging research and promoting exchange of information and material. between students scholars scientists and organizations by actively participating in various activities at national and international level sir so to dr singla sir please sir thank you dr maharaja i think i am audible to all i am highly thankful to all the family members of national veterinary University of Veterinary and Animal Sciences, Sir, especially Honorable Vice Chancellor Sir Gurdjieff Singh Ji, Dean Dr. D. P. Sharma, Controller of Examination Dr. S. K. Gupta, Patrons of this National Webinar. Dr. Gupta has long association with me, who is a great parasitologist. 
and good human being. Along with Dr. Gupta, I am highly thankful to Dr. Bora also, organizing secretary for this webinar series, who have given me the opportunity to speak on this occasion on integrated parasite control as a means of boost of animal health and productivity and Indian perspective with the participants throughout the country. Committee members, Dr. Maharana, Sneher Gupta, Anil Kumar Nehra, Amandev Mudgil, well coordinated this program. Dr. Mudgil was my PhD student, so I have long association with him. Bora also, when I was working for my PhD program, he was doing MBSc. He was a great support to me during that period of time. Thanks are also due to moderator for this program, Dr. Nareesh, along with his colleagues, for making arrangement for online program. I am, I am very happy to have privilege to deliver this lecture. However, being a great topic given to me by the organizers, I don't know whether I will be able to justify it or not. Now I will try to share my slides or document with you so that we can discuss that. So parasite control as a means to boost animal health and productivity and Indian perspective. We all know we all know that the objective of integrated control program basically is to increase the productivity, reproduction, and working capacity of the animals. At the same time, we want to protect human health by producing clean, nutritious animal products and controlling the genosis. We want to support the environmental protection also so that we should use least of the medicinal or drug drugs rather than we should adopt some of the other methods of control. Though parasites, they are very important to us, all the parasites, but in this webinar particularly, I will cover some very important aspects related to gastrointestinal parasitism caused by strong oils, scarred infections, trematodes, liver fluke infection, arthropods, and some very important arthropod born hemoproteogen infections. We all know that the parasites, they are eukaryotes, ju ju unicellular, multicellular, host specific organisms. Those are physiologically and metabolically dependent on the host and drive food and nutrition to complete their life cycle. So during that process of time, during the period of their establishment, development, and maturation, usually they harm their host. About the parasites, we have unicellular eukaryotes, that is protozoa, which are most primitive. This is followed by little, little advanced parasites, helminths. Helminths mainly cestodes, trematodes, and nematodes. You very well know about it. Cestodes are most primitive, trematodes are in between, nematodes are most advanced. Then external parasites, though we have much more external parasites as those are infected to our uh, livestock as well as pet animals. However, its flies are much more important as compared to others. As I discussed with you, everybody can ask, can get the parasites. You know our domestic animals, our wildlife, humans, animals. What? How the parasites matter? We know about it. They cause much of production losses. Sometimes we say they are chronic, but sometimes acute cause the death and they have the genetic potential also. That's why as compared to bacterial and viral infections, should we ignore these diseases? I will say certainly not, not at all, and not at any cost. Why? Because we know livestock sector is contributing loss to the Indian agricultural economy. We all know that agriculture has reached threshold at the peak. However, as far as the livestock sector is concerned, its potential is not fully ex exploited till date. So as far as livestock parasite is concerned, they are major constraint for optimum productivity and production. The column clauses of parasites are much more as compared to other diseases. Hence the parasites, I will say, they should not be ignored especially there should be a definite control policy 
so that we can be able to control these parasites. You know, parasites are being removed because they are of subclinical infection. Normally, they feel to catch the intention of livestock owners as well as the all other authorities concerned because of their subclinical nature, nature, though they are present through the globe. Production losses are much more as compared to bacterial and viral infections. We say age resistance is there as the age advances, the parasitic infections they reduce. What some of the parasitic infections are like that, that they are also important. However, certain parasitic diseases, liver infections are also important. And sometimes we say age resistance is there as the age increases, the immunity decreases. Loss of nutrients, reduced production is there. Why it is so? Because most of the parasites, as far as gastrointestinal tract is concerned, there is decreased absorption of the nutrients, leakage of nutrients, leakage of the proteins, loss of blood, already activity, the alter the activity of some of the enzymes leading to digestive disturbances, alteration in protein metabolism and hypoproteinemia. So all these things, because they are occurring, because they are occurring, hence Because such things they are occurring, they lead to production losses and all, all other things. So the resulting body composition also increased percent decrease in fat deposition, protein, skeletal muscles, and so on and so forth. So these parasites will lead to poor breeding capacity, reduced abortion. At the same time, some of the parasitic infections, they are responsible for producing immunosuppression. Also, concurrent infections, you very well know, they are common. Transmission of diseases due to that of parasites is another important. Economoclosis. So I mean to say here that parasites, they are responsible for causing greater losses as compared to all other bacterial and viral diseases or something like that. As far as parasitic diseases are concerned, we, we are able to say that these infections, they can be found in almost all the organs, including external surfaces also. So as I discussed, as I discussed with you, parasitic gastroenteritis, it is caused by strong viral infections. There may be single or multiple infections. You very well know about it. Stromites are more common in cattle and buffalo, single and mixed infections, especially in the calves. We see toxocarabitulorum, stromoidal papillosis are important. These infections are important in the first 15 days of infection, say toxocarabitulorum, and more important because of transplacental transmission or clustered through milk transmission. As we discussed with you, snail borne diseases are important. And histomes, fasciola are there, and cystosomes. Sometimes we say, very less amount of eggs containing fully developed metacillium they are passed out in the feces. Why it is so? At the same time, even if these, uh, this small amount of feces, uh, uh, eggs are being passed out, soon as soon as the sample, it comes in contact with water, the eggs hatch. So we, we are not able to get all the parasitic infections, though they may be there. So less reporting of cystosomiasis is there as compared to other trematodal infections. As in Punjab state, what we have seen that there was no published report. We have seen that cystosoma indicum is the species in studied area. Sheep had significant higher infection rate as compared to goats. And sometimes we can confuse some of the morphological characters or micrometric observations of cystosomes as, as compared to 
some of the best fitted schools. So here in this paper, we have given some comparative chart also. As I discussed with you, sheep has got more uh, cystosomes as compared to uh, goats. Similarly, if we think of paramphistomes, which are important infections here, facial law, morbidity, mortality is being caused, stones are important. Similarly, some tape bomb infections are important. Here, the, I want to discuss some, why I am discussing this, so that uh, uh, especially younger generation, they should do is some of these infections are important. The points, stromoids are there, large stromoids, small stromoids, asteroids are important. Similarly, in dogs, toxocara, tape bombs, tinea, and all others. Similarly, pig, almost all the organs are infected. As we see the life cycle, they have got direct as well as indirect life cycle, developmental stages either outside, in free living stages, but as far as the K bombs is concerned, or, or trematodes are concerned, intermediate host is there, development is occurring there also. So large amounts of developmental stages they have produced outside. That's why parasites are much more important to us. So for many years to come, many years to come, control of helminthic diseases, it mainly depends upon chemical and thermetics. Why it is so? Because as I discussed with you, development of vaccines is very slow in parasitic diseases as compared to bacterial and viral infections. There are many, many reasons you must know about it. At the same time, as far as India is concerned, pasture grazing management as a method of control, as a method of control is out of question. There is restricted lands or grazing lands are there. Some methods suggested for alternative to elementary control, they may be towards the host or towards the pre-living stages as well. But here, most of the methods here in this slide, they are related to the host related factors, condensed tenants, nematode. I will discuss one by one at later stage. So, however, none of these alternative methods as were listed in the previous slide can completely replace the enthalmetics and at best, they can be used as an adjunct to the debug. So enthalmetic should, however, be used strategically, not indiscriminately. Why it is so? Why it is so? It is due to we have want to save the cost number one, which is not much important. At the same time, we want to prevent development of resistance, which is most important, and avoid avoid the problems of residue and our environmental contamination. Hence, the enthalmetic should be not be used indiscriminately. Here, in the next few slides. I will discuss the judicious use of the enthalmetics. They should be taken as a part of integrated control program, which is most important. That's why I will discuss some of the slides. Judicious use of enthalmetics. Enthalmetics, they are necessary option for the treatment. Use of these enthalmetics should be recommended. How they, they can be used? Recommended of treatment should be on the basis of per gram of feces number one, and number two, on the signs and symptoms of the disease. Mainly, there are three four signs which are important, anemia, bottle jaw condition, diarrhea, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Please uh, close this annotation and all other things. That is important. Organizers, please note it. We must keep in mind that every enthalmetic treatment increases the risk of possible development of enthalmetic resistance. That's why it is necessary to give minimum dosing of enthalmetic in judicial use of enthalmetics. At the same time, frequent and repeated use of enthalmetics. Don't rotate the debormers. Annual or biannual repetition can be there. Change of enthalmetic within a class from Pendamanaji Ulta, no change, but resistance to one drug confers to another drug. That, that is important. Then, this slide I think is important to discuss. Don't treat all the animals in a flock. Don't treat all the animals in a flock. Please stop this annotation from outside. I have to 
raise it. 80% of the bombs are present in 20% of the plot. Am I right or wrong? I think I am right in this statement. So treat only the, those animals. Don't treat all the animals. Weight loss, diarrhea, bottles of condition, or EPG is more than three to 500 or so. It is desirable to lose, leave some of the small number of animals, clinical healthy animals here. Why it is so? Because of refugia effect, refugia. Bombs not exposed to drug, they should be present in the population. That is the important part. Let's avoid underdosing eh, as it leads to enthalmatic resistance. Normally, everybody knows about it. It is not new. Heaviest animals should be used for calculation of the dose. So pro proper dispensing is, is also important. Similarly, for the gastrointestinal parasites, goats require hard dose. So, but it is maybe merely repetition. But uh, if, if we know it, it, it is better to remind again and again. Goats, normally, it, they are given 1.5 dose of tetramizole, libamizole, and two times more dose as compared to cattle and sheep. Because why it is so? Because the cattle, they metabolize the enthalmatic drug much higher rapidly as compared to that of livestock. Similarly, as far as the monka species is concerned, recommended cutoff is 100 EPG in case of goats. Why it is so? Because if EPG is more, 200 X per gram of feces, it will lead to death of the goats. So next important point is quarantine in this slide. Quarantine. Why it is necessary? 15 days when you bring some stock outside, don't mix it with the stock. Check for the gastrointestinal parasites. Check for fecal egg counter reduction test. This fecal egg counter reduction test should be checked to know the extent of enthalmatic resistance, which is important. And even if at your own farm, must repeat every two years. We did some studies related to enthalmatic resistance against phenomenal at the organized farm. We were able to say that both the farms, sheep and goats, they have high level of resistance by fecal egg count reduction test. Then we did some work at some farms, five, uh, three farms, by multiple enthalmatic resistance by using three average based and two individually based methods. We evaluated and correlated these methods based on five egg count reduction methods at the three, three farms with the three drugs. Three drugs were Abramectin, Fenvendajo, Livabizu. Matyawada is very near to my place, Budhiana, and it was resistant to all these three drugs based on these methods. Fenvendajo, Monjivin is near Moga was registered for two drugs. So our overall results based on these three averages and two individual based methods, paper has been published here in Acta Parastologica, details can be seen here, can be best applied. Similarly, as far as these conventional methods is concerned, drug resistance is reported only when 25% of the stock is resistant. However, molecular methods you whosoever doing work on this particular area can be applied at early stage when only 1% of the population has got the resistance. So we applied real specific PCR which showed 49.28% homozygous stain and 3.62 homozygous susceptible stain, 46 and 37% heterogeneous population. Allele real frequency for resistance as well as susceptible population was 0 0.72 and 0.28%. So here also by this technique, we are able to see that high level of enthalmatic resistance do exist for homocos contortus in Western world. So you may be thinking that I have not yet started the integrated program, but as far as uh, Drugs is concerned, judicious use of drugs is concerned. Basically, this is the this remains the main targets along with others. That's why it is important. This slide is again important, drenching procedure and drenching techniques. They are very important. We should be very careful about drenching procedure, especially in sheep goat or small ruminants. 
The restricted field intake for 24 hours before drenching benzimilla juice is important. Why it is so? Some of the students and youngsters may not be knowing because it slowed down the drug contents containing drench from the room. Reduced feed intake, but it prolongs the drench uptake, drench time. So extended period of killing effect on the parasites. Sometimes what happens, some pregnant, severely stressed animals are there in those animals. We are not able, we should not rather, withhold the feed for 24 hours. So redosing can be done. This is the drenching procedure. Similarly, drenching technique is important. Among these two lower paragraphs, two things are important. One is drench should be delivered over to the tongue into the pharynx, oblique esophagus, underline it. Proper technique of the delivering of a trench should be adopted. Why it should not be given in the mouth or cheek pouch? Because esophageal groove complex can be stimulated to close, but it results into, with the result, a trench bypass the lumen. But, it, but then what happens? It results in faster drug absorption and shorter duration of drug and parasite contact, thereby decreasing the efficacy of this particular drug. So drenching technique and drenching procedure should be important. Then what should be our deworming strategy? What we should do? Should we to achieve maximum control with minimum dosing? Ma maximum control with minimum dosing. How it can be achieved? There are two methods carrying out the strategy. One on individual animal basis, second on hard basis. What is individual animal basis? Normally deworming, they, it should be done in which cases? In, uh, during the periparturient or early lactation period. Why it is important? Deworming during periparturient and early lactation period. Because large scale resumption of hypobotic larvae as well as tissue stages of the parasite in animal body during the pregnancy stress and due to the increased level of prolactins. Deworming, if we do this at this stage, it has got maximum effect. Why it is so? Because since uptake of the elementary drug is higher and faster to the resumed larvae during this period of time. Second is selective deworming, only heavily infected animals in the heart. Old statements should be not be used now. Now only selective deworming of heavily infected animals in the heart should be done. That should be based on fecal account reduction or Kumacha technique. Because why it is so? This is best because we will be using least amount of the enthalmentic while leaving some of the animals untreated till maintaining the healthy heart. It will slow down the enthalmentic resistance. For much everybody knows it, given by Phenopoeus fiber melan. I won't discuss much about it. When the animals are in the last two portion, they should be debunked. But here, where is question mark? May or may not be, depending upon the EPG and other factors. Here, the animals should not be treated. So that refugia should maintain. In the animals, this, this slide is also important as far as sheep goat is concerned. At the same time, same type of anemia chart has been prepared by the Division of Animal Health Central Sheep and Brew Research Institute to be collected. This can also be adopted. So deworming strat strategy on hard basis, if you want to on hard, with hard total hard, it should vary in area to area, timings and number of dewormings in a year and anthelmetics used should be determined based on these four factors, which are important. It should not be the same everywhere. Prevailing species of parasites, parasite load of other animals, season, season, climate, and terrain of the area. This is important. Thus, the deworming program and the anthelmetics to be used, they should be different in different agroclimatic zones. Last three lines, please read them thoroughly. Thus, the deworming program and the anthelmetics to be used differ in different agroclimatic areas and have to be decided on the basis of periodic surveys of parasitic infections in area concerned. This is important. As far as Punjab state is concerned, even in Haryana, normally we are using in sheep and goat this type of skin. Very important, as I, as I discussed with you, during periparturian rice or during early lactation, deworming should be done as 
in sheep and goat first since the first here in punjab state first strategic deworming we are doing in february and march then second we are using here in july and august this is due to high pasture load then third in october why it is so it coincides with the second lambing season so during rest of the year deworming only tactical should be done tactical but it means onset of signs and symptoms like anemia diarrhea bottle jaw condition or on account cases when it is it should be more than 2000 sheep and 1000 goats this type of procedure we are using as far as cattle and buffalo is concerned normally we deworm the calves however technical treatment should be there as far as adult cattle and buffalo is concerned toxocarbiculorum is main in calves we give 13 to 15 days after the birth of the calf a single dose of parental palmate morental or levamisole fenbendazole because it will eliminate the immature parasite before the similarly in a rat parasite tactical treatment is important in some of the years not in all trematode fluke infections are there where these infections will be more first two lines are related to that in the this slide trematode infections are in endemic and endemic in low lying areas irrigate tracts and places around permanent water works so you just make a survey data should be obtained snail control and deworming schedule should be incorporated in integrated parasite control program in those endemic areas in starfed animals you very well know these infections will be very rare but they can occur how they can occur because sometimes what happens in non endemic areas fodder is purchased from low lying places underlying it from the low which could be serve as a source of infection so if however this aspect second aspect that purchase of fodder from low, should be avoided then liver inf fluke infection or amphistom infection will not be there it will not be a problem in star fed areas you very well know if the areas in which fasciola and fistom petal buffalo sheep and goat if it there is a problem then you can give two or three strat strategic one in may and june before the onset of rainy season here we are choosing in punjab state you can choose as per your choice as per your recommendations as for the four factors as i discussed with you in may or june we are choosing here to avoid pasture contamination then once uh, the rains onset occurs some of the animals may get infection and to kill the immature from october november and then december for tactical treatment based on symptoms and signs of disease fecal examination should be followed which is important horses normally as far as stomach infections is concerned every four months three times a year and where these trematode infections are problem only two twice can be done in those areas we are doing here so similarly some areas antimicrobial drugs can also be given dogs we will know that the calves we deworm normally two times a year adult dogs can be but the important factor here in dogs is success of stray dog population to carcasses rejected viscera etc etc it should be avoided this slide i think is important i should share with you thoroughly this slide techniques for slow down of enthalmatic resistance that is important from all these previous slides we can say that choosing the proper enthalmatic in which area which type of infection is present only those enthalmatic should be used so that avoid and appropriate dose which should be discussed with you with the highest dose or highest breed animals being using effective products not expired products again it will lead to drug resistance expired products are being used follow the planned deworming program that is to be prepared as per the species as per the terrain as per the season depending upon environmental or agroclimatic zones don't use the same product for long time there should be rotation but every at every deworming it should not be as discussed in my previous slide quarantine is of course well and refugia are important too so by adopting all these techniques we can slow down the development of drug resistance sustainable integrated control program is important only enthalmatic treatment will not provide sufficient control and patients should be known there is a need of integrated control of parasitic infections why it is so is very important because of the emerging threat of enthalmatic resistance why it is so because of widespread use incorrect dosing and sometimes in increased frequency of treatment especially at the organized farm second due to decrease of pasture land india especially 
the conditions like us in Europe, Australia, and except for few organized forms. Increased public awareness of drug, now everybody knows drug residue should not be there. Sometimes we want to import some of the products outside, animal products. So increased, I, I will read this properly, increased stringency of maximum premises, permissible residue level in meat and wool in the export market has compelled to enhance the search on uh, search for other means of control, except along with the drugs. These things are important. Hence, measures for parasite management, they include those are being targeted towards the animal or towards the person. That means, I mean to say, towards the uh, pre-living stages as well as towards the par parasitic stages, which include chemotherapy, farmies, offside. Star fed animals, parcel management, immunization or immunoprotection, lethal biological control, vectors you very well know, which are important for us as far as hemoprotection and intermediate host, which are especially the snails are important. So, exploitation of host resistance is also important. So, based on this, two basic non chemical approaches can be incorporated with chemical one. That is, host stays, please, please listen, host stays directed non chemical approaches to parasite. Free living stays directed non chemical approaches for parasitic control. First, I will discuss about the host stays directed approaches, which are important. These things are important, that I think, uh, in today's lecture. Uh, genetic resistance of the host, vaccines, host nutrition, nutraceuticals, condensed tenants, herbal anthelmintics, copper oxide particles, and diatomaceous earth. So I will discuss one by one. Genetic resistance of parasites is important since the very beginning. Everybody says about it, the major factor is sustainable parasite control. It is a low cost, permanent, innate solution requiring no extra sources and incur additional cost. However, for most of the species which are resistant to parasites, usually they produce no desirable productivity traits are not there. They're, they're, that's another. Uh, that's a big problem, big issue. Here, this slide is important. Recent molecular approaches or aims. We want to identify these genes, those genes that encode parasite resistance in laboratory and morals. The to identify the location of similar genes in farm animals with the help of comparative genomic maps and. Sometimes to develop protozoanic animals in which genes of resistance are inserted economically productive breeds. Sometimes, rather than this, improvement through selection, that is their within breeds. Same breed, selection of parasite resistance and animal meets a good progress. However, as far as our livestock is concerned, this progress is slow. Why it is slow? Because the generation interval of livestock is long and there is moderate heritability. Controversial, if we were using transient animals, then sometime uncertainty is there, uncertainty of improvement. Why it is so? Because there might be side by side evolution of the parasite to change in host genotype and or inverse relationship between resistant and performance. So another option, genetic resistant vaccines, as we discussed earlier also, as far as parasitic diseases are concerned, vaccines, they are comparatively less possible achievement in the field of vaccination against the parasites. Infections have been lagged behind compared to the success achieved by other infections. Why it is so? There is a number of effective vaccines produced against the bacterial infections in man. This is, as in humans, same is true with animals. Little vaccines are there as the first vaccine is there against parasitic infections. Dictopolis B virus, Dictol vaccine prepared by Jarrett and his colleagues from Glasgow. That is the first similar vaccine was prepared in his lung bone, sheep and goat. However, vaccination or immunoprophylaxis is of little importance till date as far as these infections is concerned. Parasitic infections is done. Parvovax is an important vaccine. This is obviously the first vaccine, first immunoprophylaxis in the world for on the waste lifestyle. Hidden antigen vaccine or subunit vaccine. It contains two antigens. What is H11 
and HRGP. Practically, the problem is again in this Though it is successful in Australia, New Zealand, and South Africa, not in India, but this vaccine, first priming dose is to be given three times, and it exists, not exist for a long time, because natural boosting is not there. So such vaccine, though they are useful, such vaccine due to improved biotechnological tools may be there in the future. So from hurdles to solutions, such you know, malaria life cycle. Similarly, as far as animal life cycle is concerned, the life cycle is complex. Many developmental stages are there in life cycle of first diseases. Their capacity to evade the immune response is there from subclinical disease form to the development of vaccine is slow. However, why there is need to develop the vaccines, immunoprofluxes, due to the development of resistance in, in the, of parasite in yeast, paras, parasiticides, our efforts for developing the vaccine in yeast parasites are likely to be more than fast. Now, because of the advancement in knowledge in the field of biotechnology and with the development of tools, we will be able to identify the protective antigen and progress towards this development of immunoprofluxes should be at a faster rate. We think so. Nutrition is also important as an alternative to drug control, as an integrated control. Normally, high nutrition is required in young animals, lactating females. Why? Because due to increasing endogenous load, loss of proteins, and reducing efficiency in utilization of metabolizable energy. At times, this will give suboptimal nutrition supply. This increases the parasite challenge, this reduced leads to reduced productivity. Then, as far as India is concerned, work on the role of nutrition in management of parasitic diseases. I, I, I think so, it, it's to be initiated yet. Not much work has been done. Nutrition in relation to parasitic infection, we know that most of the parasitic infection, if we think diphalobotrium litum, deficiency of vitamin B12, hemocos, cobalt iron deficiency, hookworm infection, iron deficiency, all these type of deficiencies are being led, hence leading to pernicious anemia, decreased synthesis of vitamin B12 anemia. Similarly, if vitamins, some vitamins A, D, B are given, they develop resistance in yeast. Hence, the work on these nutritional aspects in combination to parasitic infections is very important. Nutraceuticals, some of us, they know, they refer to the crops with plant standard metabolites or nutritions, which are important as an alternative control and can be used. They are considered beneficial effect on health. They are not rather, rather than their direct effect to the nutrition. Nutraceuticals, either they can be grazed, animals can be grazed or fed after preservation. Main purpose is reducing the parasitic infection. The condensed tenants, which are present in some of the plants, attract attention in recent years. So condensed tenants, how they are useful, some of plants are there in which these are present, birch clovers are there, or sometimes the purified condensed tenants can be used. They actually reduce the fecal account 50 to 60 percent, reduce the establishment of incoming bombs. And the effect on bow wardens is these, these three points on the left hand side of the slide are important. Then some other nutrients are important, say phosphorus. Why it is important? Because when the phosphorus level in the diet was at level of 0.28% of dry matter basis, the weight gain in the lambs infected with the parasite was increased to 40%. Then those of the lambs in which phosphorus level was 0.18% on dry matter waste. Similarly, copper oxide, barrel part, ba copper oxide wire particles. Normally, these particles, they are given in gelatin capsules. These particles, they reduce the bottom burden of humongous species and maximize the immunity of the host. These copper oxide wire particles, after feeding, they come, they loss in the organism and release in high concentration of soluble copper, which is harmful to the parasites. Then coming on to the, this diatomaceous earth, some of you might not have listened or some may be knowing that sometimes what happens that pure silica, DE, 
diatomaceous earth. Basically, this is finely ground fossilized remains of tiny sea organisms. These DE it accumulates in the sea floor. When given to the animals, they have cutting edges and kill the gastrointestinal elements by evading their cuticle. This is also important part as an integrated program. Switching to herbal dewormers, sometimes since long, phytochemicals has been used to treat parasitism. Nowadays, many herbs have been evaluated for their parasitic activities. New opportunities have been arisen due to biotechnology and other tools have come up and develop anthelmintic therapies to natural molecules, small peptides, enzymes that interfere with the process of worms, metabolism, egg production, larval development, so on and so forth. But what is important to switch to the herbal deworms? Scientific validation, very important, of anti-parasitic activities and possible side effects of phytochemicals. Why in vitro and vivo experimentation is necessary before they are being adopted as an alternate mean, means of worm control. Three gyrolines are very important as far as herbal dewormers are concerned. So we did some work, first report on cytotoxicity of human aldehyde, which is a natural monoterpenoid, which is present in many of the plant sources, including human who is used in homunculus tontotus, which was resistant to albendazole. Basically, the CA, it induces reactive oxygen-related events and death of homunculus tontotus, both adult as well as l 3 And it also led to inhibition of egg hatching on exposure. Same type of study, when we did it on scanning electromicroscopy, physical damage in the interior, posterior ends, and all other bone parts were seen. So, we demonstrated that unprecedented oxidative stress, both reactive oxygen species, as you are looking at this picture inside here, albendazole is given, CA is given, control is there, you are able to see ROC and nitroxide synthesis mediated cytotoxicity of CA in East Hemocospontatus. And this present in vitro study is highly useful in wake of increasing problem drug resistance because the CA it induces oxidative stress in Moncus contatus. We have published this paper in 4.5 or more. In fact, Dr. Janal, CA is valuable by in vitro mode models or it's used in yeast gastrointestinal study that is required, that should be used. So these findings have opened a new window for pharmaceutical application of CA for the treatment of gastrointestinal elements, C I mean to see human aldehyde, human aldehyde, which induces oxidative mediated physical damage and death of the homeostatus. Then we have discussed these things when the parasites are there on the animal. Then some of the pre-living stages are there that should also be tackled so that there should be lesser need of the anthelmintics as an alternative. Three living stages directed non-chemical control Phasing management as already discussed, though it is very important, but under Indian conditions, it, it is least applicable. Grazing management preps are cornerstone of epidemiology based parasite control strategy. Cost effective, highly effective particles when combined with anthelmatic drugs also provides an opportunity, but however, it is less applicable. Biological control is important to us. Most of the work Dr. P.K. Sanyal has done on biological control. We salute to him on such type of work which can be useful uh, for our future generation, for our farmers. He has used different species of fungi. Those can be used as nematode trapping fungi, endoparasitic fungi, and fungi that produce metabolites. Among these fungi, during tonia fragrance is very important. Ground disposal, sometimes it is used as a control of parasites. Similarly, sometimes earthworms, they, they, they just break up the ground and expose the nematode parasites. I will little discuss, little discuss in the next slide regarding this duding tonia pregnancy fly. Why it is important and how can we use biological control and emerging concept. Not saying it's long ago concept, no, it is important concept. Nematode destroying microfungus during tonia, so prospective. Why it is important? 
for it, it can be used. It has some of the qualities, very important qualities. That's why it is useful for biological control. The ability to survive that crisis, number one, when it is given orally along with the feed, post penalty to grow, grow rapidly in fresh deposited dung, voracious nematophagus, it can interact, possible produce large quantity of spores, no adverse effect on environment, ubiquitous and close genetic similarity exist between different or isolates in different regions in India can be used as a feed additive in the form of blocks. That's why this type of biological control can be possible control. Then sanitation, of course, in Indian conditions is very important. One of the most effective procedures to mitigate the exposure to the parasites as we use the troughs for feeding, drinking wholesome feed, here cleaning housing, not letting the fecal material built up, raised. So these, these things are written on the these we are already using, but we should be, make care careful to the farmer to go for sanitation to so that infections can be reduced. Methods can. This was uh, there regarding gastrointestinal parasitism. Now little bit I will discuss about arthropods and related vector-borne chemoprotozoan infections. We were even low that among arthropods, ticks and flies are very important, and they are mind-boggling. Why it is so? Because they are great transmitters of great diseases, great blood suckers, great irritants. So some of the methods, those can be used either in combination or alone to control them. Management, as far as ticks is concerned, people say tick proof sets. Moors are being laid around the sheds. General hygiene, cleanliness is important. Proper disposal of dung and urine, regular grooming, it reduces the number of ticks on the animals. And of course, use of insecticide or pericides in the premises. Then chemical control can be used in the animal dip spray. Sometimes use of repellent and insect growth regulators is also important. Of course, biological control as we have using nematophagus fungi and these nematodes. Here also something can be used, some people, some maybe to some extent go as they are using gomosia feces to kill the mosquito larvae. Similarly, hemenopotas, hyper insects, sometimes they are useful. But as far as Indian conditions, I think the last paragraph is important here in the slide that domestic fowl, guinea fowl, auspackers, cattle argets are the species, are these species generally considered to have most significant effect on tick population because they can have the ticks and number of population of the ticks can be reduced on our animals. Then herbal control of course is important. Why it is important? This, this thing is important because IVRA people, along with the Lucknow based National Botanical Research Institute, have jointly developed a novel herbal formulation. Dr. Gose is there. He is doing great work, herbal hit to counter the toxic effect of chemical being used against caricides, eco friendly, non toxic, and preparation claims to have no side effects. And is unlike many other chemical preparations, what once it is commercialized, the herbal formulation hopes to play a significant role in reducing the tick population. Then immunological control, of course, can serve as an, uh, in combination with chemical control because it is able to reduce to some extent the tick population, especially it, it is there against Bufilus microplus. Though other antigenic molecules, work should be done against other ticks also, multi-host Tick host species. Tick guard was the first vaccine similar, uh, which was prepared in Australia, and uh, Gavac was in Cuba. Uh, in Pichia pastors, where similarly genetic control, sometimes style insect release technique is there. As far as recombinant the tick vaccine is concerned, tick guard, why it is useful? Once it is injected, you very well know some antibodies are produced in the blood of the host. When the this tick sucks the blood of the host, what happens? The antibodies, they come inside. They just attach because it is a concealed antigen. The antigen is present in the midgut, attach and lysis can occur. This is how this, this is vaccine is particular juice. Some other hemoprotein infections which are important uh, and they can be tackled by chemotherapy, chemoprophylaxis, immunological. They, these are some of the methods. Chemotherapy, you very know, segregation and treatment. I won't discuss much about it. Chemoprophylaxis, sometimes the drugs, when given they stay for a long time, especially trichon, say in Sarah, this is quinapyrimine chloride and sulfate combination. It can, such type of drugs, they can be given. 
in especially when take off fly season is there, they can act for a long time. Everybody knows about immunomodulation, of course, is important in some of the parasitic diseases, especially trypanosomiasis, uh, where there is immunosuppression. So, to increase the non specific immune response of the host against the parasite, ribamazole MDP has been used. Immunoprophylaxis again in, is important. Mainly in India, only as far as we know, only one vaccine is available, Laksha vaccine, which is being produced by Indian immunological. Basically, this, uh, as far as uh, this Laksha vaccine is concerned, NTDV was the, um, where, where, where all the trials were done with the ODE stain after 50 processes, 5 into 10 to 46 cyjots, they have given, everybody knows about it since 1986. Government has approved, this is the vaccine on similar lines, some more vaccines may be required in India, but uh, some more vaccines against parasites are complete, uh, but shortened life, so precautious line vaccine, immediate stains, truncated life, and toxoplasma, similarly, some other vaccines, immunoprophylaxis can be done. So uh, I think I have um, almost covered, but so are what I want to say. So I conclude like this, that though there are many alternatives to control parasite population, but some, of them are comparative, we discussed many, but sometimes some are less feasible as compared to others. Bottom control program should be specific for different regions and different agroclimatic conditions based on detailed epidemiological survey. This is important. Epidemiology and ecological studies are important. Don't choose the same type of things that I discussed with you in Punjab state. Those cannot be applicable in different areas. You have to coin your own own uh, control program based on the prevalence factors, teen and all other things. A force has to be made to use environment friendly alternative to anthelmintics, including some some of the, these things as biological control. I've discussed with nematode trapping fungi, even no prophylaxis is available, say bar barbarvax or some tick vaccines or raksha vaccine, some of them they are success. Similarly, some more uh, efforts should be made to go for you know, gen genetic resistance of the host, sometimes within the breed. It, ha it has been explored. E even uh, I have gone for some thesis at your institute, one MBAC thesis were there. We are uh, the selecting the resistant animals from the same breed, same type of work. We are also doing improvement of nutrition. Of course, it's very important, as I discussed with one slide, case some of the parasites, they are utilizing the nutrition, especially in young animals or pregnant animals. So it should also be incorporated along with it. Chemotherapeutics will remain the mainstay of integral. We cannot grow the chemotherapy, but we can reduce it up to the maximum extent, which is important. Avoiding whole flock treatment is very important as you discussed with 80% of the worms are present in 25, 20% population. So don't deworm all the animals together. Selective targeted treatment is important. It will be beneficial as far as the economy is concerned, but at the same time, it will delay the drug resistance. Problem also, then thorough market, though the market is thoroughly flooded with several class of anthelmetics. There is an urgent need for judicial use. I have taken many slides. I am sorry to say that you, I, you may get got bored also, but at the same time, judicious use in an integrated program, judicial use of drugs is important. And also for regular monitoring and efficacy and resistance by different molecule tools, as I discussed with you, we have applied molecule tools as well as conventional fecal echo reduction test by met many methods. However, as resistance can be detected in early stage, molecular methods are much more important. That can be used. Then future focus of the studies for control of parasites should be based on updating epidemiological knowledge day by day, changing scenario, changing conditions, climate change, and many things are there due to which some of the parasites, important parasites may be so. Uh, a preparation of anthelmatic schedule for agri you know, different animals in different agroclimatic zones is important. Disease forecasting based on that someone was doing some work on it. So on 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 uh, this uh, is important need to develop in major agroclimatic zones related to major parasitic infections, maybe tick bone, maybe snail bone. That is important. So I think uh, I have covered most of things. So, Dr. J.D. Ghosh was the person who has written this. Uh, it is a tribute to him because he has uh, worked on it. Man is strong 
and clever, but parasites are stronger and cleverer. Men they try to eliminate the parasite, but nature, the creator of parasites, want them to. Then what should be done? Thus, man, animal, and parasites will contribute to coexist, and our efforts would be to limit this coexistence below the economically significant threshold. Economically significant threshold is important. Then I will say, let us continue with the first in the best possible way to exploit animal parasite coexist, coexistence in our favor. That is important. Don't think you will be able to eliminate all the parasites. But we have to think it over. Okay, those should be in our favor. Lot of work has been done. Lot of things have been done. But I will say the major thing is management. None of the measures can provide complete control. An integrated approach would be most acceptable option for parasites, especially in farm animals. So, most of the biological work or biological control work has been done by Dr. P.K. Sanyal. P.K. Sanyal say, says that parasitologists are not born, but they involve, evolve. I, 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 I relish this sentence by Dr. P.K. Sanyal. Parasitologists are not born, but evolve. So thank you very much. If we take care of all these things, uh, I think we will be able to control the parasite and we will be able to uh, increase the production, the animal will be happy. Thank you all. Any queries, any questions, any details? So we can discuss something, it's possible. Ah, yes. Yeah. Yes, sir. Hello. Dr. Hello. The presentation yes, actually is Mr. Mr. Thing of the vaccine development. Actually, Indian workers. I am able to listen, sir. What's this? Hello. Please carry on. What about vaccination? Somebody was talking as far as Indian work is concerned. Sir, I will read the question, sir. Hello. Hello. Sir, this is the question from uh, Dr. Jati Ranjan. Why hot deworming is avoided? Please read it again. Sir. This is the question from Dr. Jyoti Ranjan. Why hot okay. deworming is why hot deworming should be avoided? Why deworming should be avoided? Hot, hot deworming. Why hot deworming should be avoided? I am not able to listen. Please again, Maharana. Okay. Sir, why hot deworming? Is avoided. Why hard environment should be avoided? Very important and very important question. Okay, yes. it will lead to drug resistance. Previously, we were uh, doing hard warming. Okay, uh, refugia, you understand? Refugia. refugia is very important. Some of the susceptible population should always remain within the heart. Okay, uh, so deborming deep only those animals which have got. Uh, I need mean to say symptoms, signs of disease, either uh, diarrhea, hello, diarrhea, or some um, say uh, hypoproteinemia and uh, anemia. Uh, only 20% I discussed with you have uh, of the animals have 80% of uh, uh, bone uh, load. So it is necessary that susceptible bulk population should remain in the herd. By this way, we will be able to delay the problem of drug system for a long time. Marana, I think I okay, could hear or I should discuss again. Yes, sir. It 
Something is important. Yes, sir, yes, sir. The development of drug resistance. Only those animals with the symptoms and signs of disease based on clinical account reduction test or based on FEMACHA or based on our own technique, indigenous technique produced by India, Indian people, as I discussed with you, only those animals showing symptoms and signs of disease and based on fecal account because 80% of the bombs are present in only in 20% population. So drug resistance can be delayed. That's why it is very, very important that whole herd population should be working. Okay, okay sir. So the next question is, sir, during a quarantine period, deworming is compulsory or optional? It, it uh, you just thoroughly check the animal fecal sample examination or symptoms and signs of disease. Okay, you you must deworm before uh, and at least for 15 days it should be kept. Kept and at least you should be do the deworming with the two type of dewormers to eliminate the infection if it is present because some of the parasite they will be there in immature stage hypobiotic or something like that, though drugs will be less effective, but at the same time, it is recommended. I think so. Okay. Okay. Sir, what is uh, drench resistance? Drench resistance? Hello. Me, drench means when we uh, are sir. giving... Drench sir. resistance means... What is drench I, resistance? I will just speak to... Uh, uh, while I was discussing the proper drenching. I discussed with you, drenching should be there on the tongue and it should go directly to the pharynx rather than it should not be in pouch. Drench resistance means we are giving drugs many times, many times, drenching, three, four times, especially in the herds. I discussed with you before giving particular drug in a particular area at a particular time, a drenching program should be there, not adopt our program, either that we have adapted that at least three times for stomachs, it should be given in Punjab state, same drenching program should not be there, depending upon the particular area, particular site, and depending upon particular species of the animals and plastic load, drenching program should be there. Hello. Hello. The next question is, uh, so just one minute. Mm -hmm. uh, sir, if, if fecal testing availability is not there, how frequently the deworm can be changed in order to avoid drug resistance? Please repeat. Sir, if fecal testing availability is not there, how frequently the dewormer can be changed in order to avoid drug resistance? Hope, sir. Drug resistance. Suppose there is not fecal uh, checking facility. I discussed with you FAMACHA technique. Okay. okay. Uh, computer stage is there. You can have the photographs with you. You can check the anemia. Eye checking is there. If, if it's quite right, that means at least blood, blood sucking parasites are not there. Only those animals can be dressed which are anemic, which have bottle jaw condition or some symptoms, diarrhea. And those animals which are healthy and normal behavior, they can be left behind so as to delay the drug resistance. Am I right? Okay, or sir. somebody else? Yes, sir. Sir, this is a question from Dr. K.P. Singh. Throw some K. light. On... Oh, yes, sir. Sir, throw some light on aquatic fauna those acts as biological control for parasite diseases. Throw some light on snails. Aquatic Aquatic uh, that acts as biological control. Okay. Actually, uh, snails are very important among aquatic fauna as far as uh, uh, trematodes are concerned, especially parenchystomes, fasciola, and cystosomes. Remia auriculari, as we say, it is very important. Snail, endoplanar abscesses for epistones, fasciola, similarly for cystosome. So, wherever there is collection of water, bodies are there. These trematodal infections, trematode infections are important. Normally, we can use just copper sulfate or something like that for the control of such infections. 
so that snails can be controlled and after snail control indirectly we are controlling the pest infections at the same Hello. time to treatment of drugs especially before the rain say some rainy season is there in a particular area just before the rainy season you have to give the drug so that uh, from the fecal uh, matter the, the there should not be any contamination as far as pasture is concerned after the rainy season again some of the infections may be picked up by the snails followed by the infection to the animals again after the normal hello pets, uh, we treat those animals hello Dr. Singla, uh, are, are you listening? Are you listening yes. me, Dr. K.P. Singh? Thank you, thank you, Dr. K.P. Singh. Ah, uh, to you for delivering a, such a nice lecture. I would like, thank I would just, uh, I am asking only that Jana aquatic fauna which is uh, acting as a biological control model. Okay. okay. For example, for, for example, the cyclops, for example, uh, uh, nymphids of drug, uh, dragonflies, such type of biological but control. Definitely, definitely aquatic okay. fauna is also very, please, very important. Please, please highlight this, these things because it's a current burning topic. Oh, I am sorry, I am sorry, I am very sorry. I, I was listening some way or uh, other way around. Okay, uh, though aquatic fauna is very important sometimes to control these parasitic infections. Uh, wherever uh, some of the even uh, some of the snails they can be tackled by aquatic fauna and some of the parasitic larval stages or something like that but uh, i have a little knowledge about that hello. sir hello Hanji, sir Hanji. one thing i want to say there was a potent vaccine developed by IVRI right, Srinagar right. Center long way back that is against the Dictopalax filary infection. Uh, definitely, sir. That is a different yes, vaccine, very and important and vaccine. And uh, I don't know why that has been stopped. Actually, that should not have been stopped. That is That was a useful vaccine, it was being used in uh, Srinagar or some areas by Dr. Taran Sharma or something like that. Am I right? Uh, now, your question, please. Dr. Anil Sharma and Dr. T.K. Bhatt, and there are about 75 foreign publications from them. Definitely, sir. Definitely. Just like uh, it is the same, but in, uh, in, in sheep and goat. If you kindly permit, in your presentation, one thing is lacking, that you should compare that and what is the advantage and disadvantage. Suppose when you... Because, Dr. Sam, it is, uh, I am sorry for that. Uh, though though it, could, it could have been better if I would have compared, but being a long lecture, including all these things, not only, only on, on, on immunoproduxes, on biological just, control. Just, say uh, just, not, just for our knowledge, you say something. What is the difference between the irradiated vaccine and the recombinant vaccine? Why the irradiated vaccine was not preferred? That should be focused before the young generation. That is the request. Yes, yes. We just focus. Yes. You very well know that uh, the, the, it varies. Some some of the positive factors are there in a radiated vaccine. Some more positive vaccines, uh, as we developed based on uh, based on this uh, bi biological uh, biotechnology based tools, recombinant vaccine, those are comparatively less harmless. Okay, though they have got specific targets and specific immunodominant antigen. That that's the main reason that normally we prefer the, but at the same time, sometimes natural exposure is not there in such type of vaccine as we are seeing for this, uh, even barber wax, though it is important, it is able to control, but at the same time, it is not useful for natural exposure. Okay, you being used in Australia, New Zealand and South Africa, but at the same time, sometimes even native antigens, they are useful. It depends upon what type of parasite, what type of antigen, and how it is being used. I think so. This is my personal opinion. Is there any information to you? Okay, sir. Thank you very much for such a wonderful lecture. And uh, sir, we all recognize the tremendous effort and energy you put in your uh, presentation. Um, thank you very so much for the organizers. 
sir it was an excellent presentation we are really captivated by your energy words sir now i request uh, dr snail to uh, propose vote of thanks to dr sila over to dr snail so uh, a very good morning everyone i am highly thankful to the organizing committee that provides me an opportunity to extend my heartfelt thanks to dr ld singh sir we all recognize the tremendous efforts and the energy that you put in your presentation it was indeed an energy driving words for all the budding veterinarians the amount of the attention that you give on the future thrust area of research and the holistic approach for sustainable control of parasites was really very educational and persuasive it was indeed a delightful presentation so we are highly thankful that you have answered all the questions of our participant on behalf of myself participants and the organizing committee i extend my deepest gratitude to dr ld singla who spared time from his busiest schedule to grace the very first lecture of our webinar thank you once again sir thank you dr snehal and all the organizing committee for giving me this opportunity to present my talk in such a big form thank you all just beginning that sir aap batao dear participants if any questions are un remain uncovered due to the time constraints they will be covered and the answer will be mailed to you on your respective email ids thank you or on the facebook i would like to invite our next speaker dr ml batne sir uh, before that i should like to before we would like to introduce dr ml batna batne sir a dynamic and energetic canon practitioner and ex register maharashtra agriculture and fisheries science university dr ml gatne worked on various capacities in bombay veterinary college and finally after bhrs in 2017 he has guided 18 post graduate students during his career he made his hat trick with the prestigious best teacher award during his career he has published over 60 research articles in journal of national and international repute and delivered a number of radio and television talks He has established molecular parasite lab in Bombay Veterinary College. He is also credited for the discovery of a new species of wild carnivore hookworm, that is Golancos ramohani, in India. He has also been a member of expert panel of Agriculture Scientist Recruitment Board, New Delhi, and many recruitment and promotion of assistant professors and associate professors. Dr. Gatney was actively engaged in research activities also. He was involved in three international. to national and 11 industry sponsored projects during his academic career he has visited canada south africa thailand singapore south korea usa and 12 european countries he is the founder member of tropica council for company animal parasitology he worked as india representative in india asia pacific forum on canine vector borne diseases for six years apart from activities Dr. Gatne showed his skill in co-curricular activities also. Among several awards in sports activities, one key achievement worth mentioning over here is that he also served as captain of veterinary cricket team of India that participated in veterinary World Cup in South Africa 2003. There are several awards in the back of Dr. Gatne that could not be completed in this short duration. We are happy for that to get his consent for the current webinar. The keynote. Knowledge shared is the knowledge squared. We would like to request Dr. Gatne to enlighten us with his experience. Over to Dr. Gatne, sir. Please, sir. Ah, uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank the organizers, Dr. Sukti Pora, Dr. Maharana, for giving me this opportunity to share whatever little is known to me on this particular topic with you all. 
more particularly the youngsters, undergraduate and postgraduate students. Uh, this is my fifth webinar of the lockdown period, and I am slowly getting accustomed to this mode of communication. During the uh, first two episodes, I had a very weird feeling. You can imagine a person sitting in an isolated room with a laptop in front of him and like a mad person talking for 30 to 40 minutes without having bothered to know what is happening at the receiving end. And the attire also used to be like that, a decent shirt, maybe a tie around it, necktie, and a barbuda on the vest. <laughs> so slowly I'm getting used to it. And uh, I actually wanted to spend these few moments to warm up myself and also to provide some moments for the audience to come out of the impact of Dr. Singla's lecture. Now, uh, coming to my topic, that is epidemiology of canine vector bone diseases in India with reference to clinical management. Uh, canine vector bone diseases is a very important topic, not because this is a topic of today's webinar and I'm delivering it and I would like to blow my own trumpets, but it is really important for the pet practitioners and also for the researchers and academicians for a number of reasons. Number one, the canine population is increasing gradually in India. Today, we have 23 million dogs in our country. Then different types of arthropods. Hello, can you hear me? I can't see my own slides. Ah, you can yeah. hear you, sir, but slide is blank. Yeah, now, now, now slide is coming. Oh, now okay. it's okay. Okay, okay. So, the different types of arthropods like ticks, flies, uh, fleas, which act as a vector for a number of diseases, have withstood the challenges put forth by the scientific community over the last few decades. And they are still existing, probably with more vengeance and they are involved in the transmission of number of vector bone diseases, some of which are very complex to handle in the clinics. Some may reach a life threatening situation if not attended in time. So because of these reasons, canine vector bone diseases are very important. In recognition of this fact, uh, the World Forum for Canine Vector Bone Diseases, which is popularly abbreviated as CVBD, was established somewhere in the year 2004 or 2005, to which number of regional chapters have been associated. I was fortunate to be India representative on Canine Vector Bone Disease Forum for Asia Pacific region for about four to five years. There is one more organization and that is Tropical Council for Companion Animal Parasites, which was established in the year 2013 and 14 and I was also the member of the founder group. Uh, the objectives of these two organizations are common. Number one is to keep up the pace with the expansion of uh, canine vector bone diseases. As uh, canine vector bone diseases are expanding throughout the world and uh, the list of uh, vector bone infection is extending, the vector potential of different arthropods uh, is uh, widening and with the amount of pet travel, domestic as well as international, new infections are venturing into different geographical regions. So you need a group uh, of scientists who would monitor the expansion of uh, this particular group of parasites. And second is to bridge the knowledge gaps between the researchers and the pet practitioners with the intention that the information will then percolate to even pet owners. Of course, in 30 to 40 minutes, uh, it is uh, practically not possible to cover all the aspects of uh, CVBD. Uh, so, for in-depth knowledge, you can log on to these two uh, websites uh, for detailed information. Let me acknowledge at this point of time, I have uh, gathered quite a few points from the publications of these two organizations. Now, if you look at uh, the canine vector bone diseases, which can be divided into three types, tick bone diseases, fly bone diseases, and flea bone diseases. Let me complete flea bone diseases on this plate itself. Acanthochylonema recunditum, which is a new name for dipetalonema recunditum, is transmitted by the fleas. 
The most common flea occurring on the body of dogs is Tinocephalidus felis. Yes, you have heard it right. It is Tinocephalidus felis. And it is involved in the transmission of Acanthochylonema recondita. There are two more species of Acanthochylonema, but transmitted by different arthropods. One is Acanthochylonema draconculidus, which is transmitted by the flies, hippobusted flies. And the other species is Acanthochylonema grassi, which is transmitted by ticks. But these uh, Acanthochylonema species are not of a major concern in India because of the low, low prevalence. Then uh, the prevalence is also sporadic. They are not uh, very pathogenic and they do not pose a serious uh, zoonotic threat to human population. So let me switch over to flybone uh, infections. In the list, uh, the most uh, important is trypanosomosis, which is caused by trypanosoma evansi and spread mechanically by stomoxis, lyprosia, and tabana species of flies. Dogs also acquire infection by consuming the viscera of infected ruminants if the carcass is lying unattended. And the dogs also acquire infection by consuming rodents. About eight to nine years back, we had conducted one survey on canine trypanosomosis in Mumbai. And during that survey, we encountered around 10 to 15 percent of the cases from the localities which uh, had uh, no reservoir populations like cattle, buffalo, or horses. So we assume that uh, the dogs may have contracted the infection by consuming rodents. Two to three years later, we had conducted one more survey on parasites of rodents in Mumbai. And in that survey, we encountered a couple of cases of Trypanosoma evansi in rodents. So this finding corresponded well with the uh, findings of the previous uh, study. Uh, the clinical uh, entity of Trypanosoma evansi, I will discuss with the tick-borne diseases because the clinically it resembles with the tick-borne diseases. The next in the list is leishmanosis. As you all know, there are two forms, visceral leishmanosis occurring in northeast region in human beings primarily. Of late, there are a couple of references about its occurrence in the goats also. Uh, but as far as canines are concerned, there is only one species which is important and that is Lishmania tropica. And these cases are reported from northwest region that is from Rajasthan and in adjacent area where the infection cutaneous filaria, uh, cutaneous Lishmanosis is occurring in both the forms, anthroponotic form as well as zoonotic form. Uh, since the, the distribution is limited to one particular part of India, I will not be talking further on leishmanosis in this particular presentation. Then coming to filariosis caused by Dirofilaria and Brugia species. Uh, Dirofilaria emitters the heartworm and Dirofilaria repens, which resides in the subcutaneous tissues of dogs. There is a new name proposed for the uh, Dirofilaria repens, and that is Noctiella repens. Brugia malaya is actually the lymphatic filarid worms of human beings uh, reported from the southern parts of India. But there are a couple of reports about its occurrence in dogs also and that has uh, triggered the question whether the dogs are acting as a reservoir for uh, Brugia malaya for human population. There are a few indirect references about Brugia pahangai but I have my own reservations depending upon the details of these uh, publications. Uh, let me then talk about now dirofilariosis, epidemiology of dirofilariosis. Uh, let me tell you at this point of time that there are very few systematic studies. These cases are reported during the blood examination when microfilarial stages are detected. Uh, about say 50% of the cases are uh, detected accidentally. That means the blood is examined for mm -hmm. some other reason and microfilaria are detected. And these microfilarial stages are identified on the basis of morphology and micrometry. But uh, let me tell you that uh, uh, that the it is very difficult to differentiate microfilaria of a different filarid worms on the basis of morphometry. Regarding the distribution of uh, dirofilariosis, dirofilaria repens is a very common parasite and it has been reported from different parts of India. As far as Dirofilaria emitis is concerned, it has been reported uh, uh, there is some regional distribution from the northeast region 
and from the coastal zones of uh, northeast region and also there are some reports uh, from uh, from the southern parts of india the mosquitoes are the main oh, transmitting oh, agents Mos uh, mosquitoes are the main uh, are the agents like aedes species tulip species and anopheles uh, species In to be the vector of uh, different dirofilaria species. As far as the disease entity is concerned, uh, dirofilaria repens is uh, subclinical and uh, at the most it is responsible for causing nodules in the subcutaneous tissues and majority of the cases are asymptomatic. But dirofilaria emitis may be associated with the symptoms depending upon the number of adult worms present in the pulmonary arteries where they cause a mechanical interference leading to pulmonary hypertension. So one of the early signs of dirofilaria emitis infection is breathlessness after the usual exercise or intolerance to usual exercise. And as the disease progresses, as the mechanical interference continues or grows in magnitude, then the pulmonary hypertension also increases and that leads to, that leads to, uh, to uh, the respiratory distress as well as the cardiac uh, or the circulatory distress. So the respiratory symptoms are very typical. There are uh, episodes of shallow breathing and after a few shallow breaths, there is a typical respiratory movement. There is a forceful inhalation and with that the rib cage is expanded there is a pause and after that there is a very gradual or slow exhalation i don't know how many of you practice meditation but when you do pranayam it is usually recommended that your exhalation should be one and a half times longer than the inhalation so the situation here is somewhat similar to that though the dog is not meditating here it is a case of medication as uh, if it continues and if it is not attended in time, then it may lead to passive venous congestion and congestive cardiac failure leading to death. Regarding the zoonotic transmission, uh, both are identified as a parasitic zoonosis, but uh, I could trace only one reference of a human heart worm infection in India and that was from Mumbai. Apart from that, I could not get uh, references of human heart worm in India. While dirofilaria repens is an emerging zoonosis, there are a number of cases which have been reported in the recent past. And uh, when it is uh, jumped on the, jumped on to human beings, then they are responsible for causing noodles. Uh, I'm getting echoes. Somebody has opened the mic. Hello. 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 Yeah. Okay. So, in human beings, they are responsible for causing nodules in the subcutaneous tissues, which may be palpable. Occasionally, they may settle into the eyeball, leading to ocular dirofilariosis. And then the scientific name is also changed. It is then called as dirofilaria conjunctiva. I have myself witnessed a couple of cases of uh, ocular dirofilariosis in Mumbai. Then coming to the tick-borne diseases. Now let me tell you about the ticks occurring on dogs in India. It is basically Rhipicephalus sanguinus, which is a brown dog tick occurring ubiquitously throughout the length and breadth of India. In addition to that, there is one more species and that is Haemophysalis, but it shows a regional distribution. It has been reported from the colder parts of uh, India. Uh, the organisms which are reported from different parts of India or the diseases, vector-borne diseases or tick-borne diseases is hepatozoonosis caused by uh, hepatozoon canis, ehrlichiosis caused by uh, ehrlichia canis which is uh, Sorry. I'm trying to get a previous plate. Issue of internet. Can you hear me? 
Hello, can you hear me? Yes, sir. You are audible, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, I, I I want to the previous slide, but it is getting shifted. But I'll continue talking on that. Okay. Hepatozoonosis is caused by hepatozoon canis. Then ehrlichiosis caused by ehrlichia canis, that is canine monocytic ehrlichiosis. Then anaplasma platelets has also been reported in thrombocytes. I have seen a couple of references about anaplasma phagocytophilium, uh, but I have my own questions about the authenticity of this particular species because it occurs in the granulocytes. And on the basis of morphology, it is very difficult to identify the organisms in the granules of granulocytes. Then there is a pyroplasmosis or a babesiosis, which is caused by two types of uh, pyroplasm, babesia, uh, babesia vogeli, which is a new name for babesia canis, and uh, babesia gibsoni, which is a small pyroplasm. Babesia vogeli is usually seen in young dogs below one year of age. It shows pathogenicity in uh, young dogs, while Babesia gibsoni can occur in any uh, uh, dogs of any age. Then there is a Mycoplasma hemocanis, and uh, Mycoplasma hemocanis is responsible for causing mycoplasmosis, which is a new name for Hemobartonella canis, and uh, it is also transmitted by ticks. Now, if you look at all these this stated in the literature, that Rhephocephalus sanguinus is involved in the transmission. Yeah, so Rhephocephalus uh, uh, sanguinus is involved in the transmission of all these infections. But let me tell you that regarding Babesia gibsoni, Rhephocephalus sanguinus is considered as a putative vector and uh, Haemophysal species is considered as a confirmed vector. Then, uh, him, amongst all these organisms, hepatozoon canis is uh, transmitted by consumption of the ticks. It is a common uh, observation that the dogs turning around and biting the infested portion of the body, and in the process, the ticks are swallowed, and that is how hepatozoon canis infection is uh, transmitted. Uh, I have also seen a couple of owners, you know, uh, they are taking out the big fat ticks from the body of the uh, dog while watching some TVs and the, then the ticks are squashed on the floor and the hemolymph oozes out from the dead ticks and it is quietly licked by the dog sitting beside the owner. Some of the owners also have a weird idea in their mind that the dog is getting its blood back by allowing this. All other infections are transmitted uh, during the hematophagous activity. Now, let me talk about the epidemiological scenario of uh, tick-borne diseases. What is uh, epidemiology? Epidemiology is a frequency of occurrence of a disease in a population in a region with respect to different climates, with respect to different species of animals, different breeds within the species, different age groups, then either gender, male or female, whether the dog is a neutered dog or an intact dog, and in addition to that, certain clinical parameters are also included, like uh, what are the predominant signs, what is the incubation period, then morbidity rate, mortality rate, the reservoirs in the, uh, in the population. So, if you want to undertake a study comprehensively covering all these parameters over a period of two to three years, and based on uh, sensitive techniques like molecular tools, Huge funds are required. I don't know what is the situation in the developed countries. Probably, you know, the funds are available for the important diseases. But in India, the funds are not available for the research projects on companion animals. The government agencies like DBT, DST, ICR, they are not inclined to fund the research projects on uh, companion animals. I am not blaming them. They are right. It is justified. Because in an agro-based economy, the main focus is on livestock and livestock production. But the fact remains that the funds are not available for the research and companions. So, if you go through the literature, you will find that uh, the number is being carried out. But uh, from the materials and methods and from the results, it appears 
that you know there are certain limitations there are certain loopholes written in the observations or in the results i have listed some of the loopholes like you know 10 to 20% of the papers are based on the case reports or the necropsy findings and all possible symptoms or hematopoiechemical or or the necropsy finding cross or histopathology are linked with the organism which is being uh, reported then second is a bias survey i can uh, explain this with an example uh, with my own studies you know the prevalence of hepatosome canis in pyrexia cases so in the first place it is assumed that uh, all hepatosome cases uh, will uh, have a pyrexia number 2 the different uh, etiological factors responsible for pyrexia are not assessed in the paper number 3 the frequency of occurrence of pyrexia cases with respect to different seasons uh, are not uh, discussed so these uh, surveys they give you unidimensional results or the results are unidirectional which are not taking us to the ground reality or closer to the fact then these surveys are carried out on the basis of uh, insensitive diagnostic methods like uh, blood smear examination i need not throw light upon this because all of us are parasitologists you know then there are certain sampling errors the sample pool should reflect all the vulnerable groups in the population and as far as possible portion for example if you are talking about the research project or a survey work on dogs you should know what is the proportion of stray animals to the pet animals and that proportion should be reflected in the sample pool of course the statistical analysis will take care of such differences but there is also limitation to that and then the last point is like uh, the pet practitioners they are not interested in publication the pet practitioners are handling these cases on day to day basis and they are doing a fantastic job in their clinics lot of information is born in the clinic but the same information dies within the four walls of the clinic because it doesn't seem it doesn't see the limelight of publication probably these are pet practitioners do not derive any uh, benefits out of publication so they should be encouraged to publish uh, so when you are constructing the epidemiological scenario it is like uh, solving the jigsaw puzzle uh in our school days we have solved the jigsaw puzzle 1000 pieces or 2000 pieces where the small pieces are interlinked to create a big picture creating a epidemiological picture is like a jigsaw puzzle where the information which is available in the literature in bits and pieces should be assembled logistically to create a epidemiological scenario and which is not happening when you go through the literature in india pertaining to canine vector bone diseases in this context i would like to draw your attention to these two important papers the first one is a review article on canine vector bone diseases in india a review of literature and identification of existing knowledge gaps this is particularly for the youngsters or the post graduate students who are planning to take up a research on canine vector bone diseases should uh, read this particular paper so that the errors will not be committed and the second is a survey of canine tick borne diseases in india to the best of my knowledge this is the most accomplished survey carried till this date uh, on canine vector borne diseases it will be like a curtain raiser for all of you i am going to share some of the silent features of uh, our, uh, research uh, this was carried out way back in 2011 and in this uh, survey the blood samples of 525 apparently healthy dogs were collected from delhi mumbai sikkim and uh, ladakh each uh, center represent a different climatic zones and then the samples were subjected to conventional parasitological technique as well as the molecular techniques and the results of molecular techniques or the pcr products were sequenced and compared with the available gene banks for the authentication of the data now this table depicts the results of molecular analysis and as you can see here the first row where uh, the prevalence of ticks is 75% in delhi and 80% in mumbai 
comparatively the prevalence rate was low in the other two centers uh mind you uh, these two re uh, centers represent say around 60 to 70 percent geographical area of india climate wise of course there are certain other parameters which also contribute to the prevalence of the ticks then if you look at the prevalence of the uh, tick borne diseases it was found to be 77.2 percent in delhi and 59.2 percent in mumbai and mind you these were all from apparently healthy dogs so these infections are prevailing in a subclinical forms further if you look at the percentage of the mix infection in delhi it was 44.5 while in mumbai it was 35.2 involving two three or four species of organisms the most common species encountered during the study was hepatozoon canis followed by ehrlichia canis then uh, mycoplasma hemocanis so i can say delhi and mumbai are endemic to these three uh, tick borne diseases then anaplasma platys babesia vogelii and babesia gibsoni it is very surprising that only one case of babesia gibsoni was encountered in the study not from mumbai uh, we see quite a few reports from the pathology laboratory indicating occurrence of babesia gibsoni uh, then i will talk about the multivariate risk uh, factor analysis uh, the dogs infected with uh, tick borne diseases had a lower pcv as compared to non infected dogs and this difference was statistically significant the chances of tick borne diseases in dogs having ticks on the body are 3.3 times higher than the dogs without ticks so that emphasizes the control of ticks and this is uh, something new the chances of uh, tick diseases in intact dogs are 1.9 times higher than the neutered dogs and the chances of tick borne diseases in stray dogs are higher which is expected 2 to 3 point times higher than the pet dogs now let me talk about the clinical entity uh, i will be talking on the uh, clinical entity with the clinician's perspective so if you set a clinical radar for detection of these canine vector borne diseases then what are the presenting signs or what are the complaints from the pet owners it is basically lethargy depression there may be edema of the dependent parts the dogs are off feed that means there is anorexia some of the pet owners will also tell about the pyrexia or fever so when the case is presented these are the presenting signs then when the case is investigated on the table then the pet practitioner will come to know about the mucous membrane whether it is pale or enteric or there may be petechial hemorrhages or ecchymotic hemorrhages on the mucosa enlargement of liver enlargement of spleen and there is also enlargement of lymph or a lymph adenopathy so when you look at all these uh, symptoms it definitely indicates that this is one of the canine vector borne diseases but without specifying the organisms involved in the infection so the symptoms are suggestive but not confirmative because none of the symptoms is a pathognomonic for the canine vector borne diseases of course there are certain additional symptoms which you know deflects related to one particular species of organism for example in early cases there are phases of bleeding tendencies from the natural orifices like there could be epistaxis hematostasis then there is uh, hematuria there may be blood in the stools or melina and there is lymphadenopathy but uh, i you should also bear in mind that uh, such uh, bleeding tendencies Uh, are also seen in the terminal cases of uh, pyroplasmosis or lymphadenopathy can be seen in trypanosomosis so although it is uh, suggestive of ehrlichiosis you should differentiate from pyroplasmosis and trypanosomosis then in addition to that you will also see nervous signs associated with uh, these cases particularly in case of trypanosomosis like convulsions nodding of head or hair pressing But nervous signs are also seen in the terminal cases of pyroplasmosis what i would like to emphasize here that all these symptoms are suggestive of canine vector borne diseases but uh, you cannot identify on the basis of symptoms 
the etiological factors involved in the infection. So in such situation, the normal tendency of the pet practitioner is to collect the blood samples, serum samples for hematobiochemical profile or analysis, and also for the detection of the organisms or the uh, DNA of the organisms, antigen of the organisms, or antibodies against the organisms. Let me talk about the hematobiochemical profiles in these uh, canine vector bone infections. Uh, it is uh, mostly the, some, uh, the uh, profiles or the changes are masking or overlapping. In all these cases, you will see anemia with the drop in PCV, erythrocyte count, and hemoglobin percentage. The anemia is normochromic, normocytic, with the erythrocytic indices are well within the normal range. It is mostly regenerative because the reticulocyte index indicates it is a regenerative type. And then, cytopenia. I have purposely printed it in red because most of the pet practitioners consider thrombocytopenia means it is a case of canine ehrlichiosis. Some of the pet practitioners also equate thrombocytopenia with ehrlichiosis. And in my opinion, this is a big error or a mistake because thrombocytopenia is seen not only in ehrlichiosis, but in all other vector bone infections, it also seen in some of the viral infections. It could be the result of the adverse drug reaction and thrombocytopenia is also observed for a transient period after vaccination in dogs. So thrombocytopenia should not be equated with uh, Ehrlichia. Of course, it is a strong uh, suspicion about Ehrlichia, but you should do the differential diagnosis. In biochemical profiles, uh, you don't get a very specific clue about the species of uh, organisms involved in the infection. There may be high levels of serum creatinine and blood urea nitrogen, which may be seen in ehrlichiosis, pyroplasmosis, and also trypanosomosis. Of course, you know, the appearance of these changes uh, occur at a different stages depending upon the organism. In ehrlichiosis, it may appear little earlier than pyroplasmosis and trypanosomosis. There is a reversing of albumin globin ratio that is in long-standing cases. I would like to mention here, when you come across a constant high level of HCOT and SGPT, you can think of hepatozoonosis because in hepatozoonosis, there is an enlargement of liver and there is an inflammation of the liver and HCOT and HCPT levels persist at a higher level for a longer period. Now, let's see what are the uh, reasons for thrombocytopenia. Uh, in case of observe thrombocytopenia are not then there could be you know antiplatelet antibodies particularly in case of ehrlichiosis and pyroplasmosis there could be intravascular coagulopathies that is seen in pyroplasmosis then there it could be because of the consumptive process that means the platelets or the thrombocytes are utilized uh, because of the endothelial injury and as a result of which there is a thrombocytopenia which is seen in canine monocytic ehrlichiosis as well as in babesiosis. All these infections, there is a, a inflammation of the liver. There are certain changes in the kidneys. And as you all know, these are the organs where thrombopiotin is created, which is required for the production of thrombocytes. So these are various reasons for thrombocytopenia. And one must analyze and should not equate thrombocytopenia with uh, Ehrlichiosis. Now, as far as a species specific diagnosis of canine vector bone diseases, there are three approaches conventional method, immunological methods, and the molecular methods. In conventional methods, as you all know, there is a low sensitivity, uh, and particularly in case of pyroplasmosis, ehrlichiosis, mycoplasmosis, the sensitivity is very low. But uh, you can improve the sensitivity of uh, blood smear examination by collecting at least three to four samples during the active phase of infection or acute phase of infection from the peripheral circulation, that is from the tip of the ear pinna. I have seen some of the pet practitioners collecting the blood samples from the ear vein, which is not a correct method. It should be collected from the tip of the ear where there are no major blood vessels. And about 0.3 to 0.5 ml of blood can be collected and it can be centrifuged in the laboratory 
to get the Buffy code and then the Buffy code smear should be prepared. So by doing these manipulations, you can improve the uh, sensitivity of conventional techniques. But as you all know, as you might have even experienced, the blood smear examination is very time consuming. It is a tedious method. In order to declare that the blood smear is negative for uh, hemoprotozoan parasites or the organisms, one has to screen the blood smear religiously for 25 to 30 minutes. So it is also very strenuous for eyes. One cannot see more than six to seven blood smears in a day. So these are some of the shortcomings. Let us come to immunological approach. Nowadays, uh, the immunological kits are available, which are very easy to perform, which are very user friendly. SNAP4, SNAP5, these are kits are available and within 20 to 30 minutes, the results are available. But there are some problems or limitations associated with this method also, and particularly in endemic area. The specificity is low because of the cross reactivity and false positivity. Then in endemic region, uh, these methods to distinguish or discriminate between the current infection and uh, past infection. And uh, early infections are also not diagnosed because generally in hemoprotozoan infection, it takes around uh, 14 to 28 days for the zero conversion when the antibodies appear in the blood circulation. So there are some limitations associated with this approach also. Coming to the molecular methods, uh, it is a real answer. The sensitivity is good. The specificity is also good. But the problem is that it requires a sophisticated laboratory. And the current scenario is that these methods are not available throughout India. These methods are also expensive and it may be cost prohibitive for certain uh, pet owners. So there are some limitations associated with all these approaches. And uh, yeah, these are the organisms. I think I can skip through this particular slide because you all are parasitologists and well versed with the morphology of uh, these organisms. So the if the scenario of the canine vector bone diseases what the problems uh, the pet practitioners are facing that uh, the clinical symptoms are sensitive but not confirmative because none of the clinical signs uh, is a uh, pathognomonic and then let me tell you at this point of time that whenever there is a multiple infection or a mixed infection the pathophysiology of the individual organism may be altered to greater extent and some of the weird signs are also exhibited. So diagnosis on the basis of uh, clinical symptoms is extremely difficult. Uh, then there is also diagnostic dilemma. The reports from the laboratory are concerned because hematobiochemical profiles are indicative but not confirmative. So the picture is same as the uh, symptoms. Then the diagnosis, the species specific diagnosis may not be achieved. Hardly in 30 to 40 percent of the cases, species uh, specific diagnosis can be achieved by the conventional techniques. So uh, the clinicians are under uh, dilemma how to go about it. So in such situation, the pet practitioners, what they do, they go ahead with their presumptive diagnosis. Uh, they go ahead with their presumptive diagnosis and treat the case on the basis of presumptive diagnosis and then Response to the diagnosis is taken as a confirmation of the presumptive diagnosis. But let me tell you that the response to the treatment may be deceptive because there are very few options, chemotherapeutic options available to us or the pet practitioners. And one particular compound is efficacious against different types of organisms. Let me explain this with an example that suppose on the basis of presumptive diagnosis, if the case is identified as uh, uh, ehrlichiosis, but actually the case is infected with hepatozoonosis, then for ehrlichiosis, doxycycline drug is given. But doxycycline is also effective on the hepatozoonosis and there is a symptomatic relief. So that is what I meant that the response to the treatment is deceptive. The problem is further compounded because in majority of the cases, complete elimination, 100% elimination of the organisms may not be achieved. Barring exception of trypanosomosis and to some extent mycoplasmosis, 
elimination of the organisms, 100% elimination is not achieved in case of pyroplasmosis, early chiosis, or hepatozoonosis. So, these organisms remain in the body for a longer period as a subclinical infection, and they act as a source of infection for the vectors to transmit it to the clean individual. Also responsible for subsequent relapses, particularly during stressful situation. So that is the big uh, question at present facing uh, the pet practitioners are facing, but they are with these uh, limited resources doing a fantastic job. And of course, in I have said something about what is to be done. So let me talk about the treatment aspect. Now, majority of the recommendations I have taken from the uh, website of uh, TROCAP, that is Tropical Council of uh, Ban and Animal Parasites. Uh, I will not be talking in details about the dose and other aspect. I will just talk about the drug of choice for the particular infection. Now, in case of hepatozoon canis, the drug of choice is imidocarb, and it should be given fortnightly basis and it should be continued till the disappearance of the organisms from the blood smear or from the body of the host. But it takes uh, uh, more than four to five uh, treatments and even after that, the organisms still appear in the blood smears. And one has to then consider whether to continue imidocarb because there are certain side effects. So there are a number of relapses. So how to deal these relapse cases? Nowadays, people are using the combination of TCP, that is trimethoprin and sulfa with clindamycin and pyrimethamine. I have my own doubts about the availability of pyrimethamine in India, but uh, elsewhere, you know, these combinations are used. Coming to trypanosoma evansi, the drug of choice is anthracide prosalt, but one has to assess the, uh, the condition of the drug. Uh, suffering from trypanosomosis because if the liver values or the liver profile is not normal, I would uh, suggest that one should be very careful in administrating anthracite prosalt because it is associated with some side effects. Some clinicians the dose, total dose is 5 milligram per kg, which divide into 2 of 2.5 milligram per kg and it is administered subcutaneously. Alternatively, the clinicians are using diminazine. Uh, diminazine is also associated with some side effects, but uh, it is better than antricide if the case is not uh, stable. So, I mean, if it is available, can also be used uh, intravenously. It should be diluted sufficiently with dextrose. Dextrose is required because, as you all know, in trypanosomosis, there is hypoglycemia. Then come to mycoplasmosis, uh, which can be tackled uh, Comparatively, uh, ease with uh, doxycycline, it should be given on a daily basis for uh, for three weeks, and then in ninety percent of the cases, the organisms can be eliminated. Alternatively, oxytetracycline can be used, but I would prefer doxycycline, or the the recommendation from Procap is doxycycline. Then this is the plate I have taken as it is from the. Uh, website of uh, TROCAP regarding treatment of pyroplasmosis. There are two varieties, as you know, the large pyroplasm and small pyroplasm. This Barisha, the drug of choice as per the recommendation is imidocarb milligram per kg. But I have my own reservations because generally Babesha Vogelai cases are seen in uh, young dogs and use of imidocarb in young dogs. I have got my own questions. So, diaminazine is used for treatment of Babesia vogela. Now, coming to treatment of Babesia gibsoni, there is a big problem. Number of drugs have been tried. You can see on the screen, parvocone, autovocone. Autovocone is anti-malarial drug. Azithromycin, which is usually used for antibiotic use for infection, clindamycin. The most effective combination if you see the world literature, is a combination of autovocone and azithromycin. But autovocone is not available in India. It is very expensive. So in India, the, these cases are now treated with the triple combination of the drugs. 
that is clindamycin, metronidazole, and doxycycline. And a prolonged treatment is required for a period of six weeks if it is clubbed with diaminazine, or for 12 weeks on a daily basis if it is not clubbed with diaminazine. So, treatment of Babesia gibsoni is a big problem. Then, treatment of early keosis, number of drugs have been tested, and now it has been, you know, uh, treated with doxycycline, which is also the recommendation by the organizations that doxycycline at the rate of 10 milligram per kg on a daily basis. And there are different uh, regimes are used from three weeks to 60 days. See, some of the uh, pet practitioners are also using imidocarb, but doxycycline is the drug of choice. Then coming to heartworm, uh, two uh, types of treatment. First type is the treatment of the adult worms, heartworms, with a milarosomine 2.5 milligram per kg. Three injections are required. The second injection is given after the one month of the first injection, and third injection is given after 24 hours of the second. There is a big prerequisite to this. The dog should be stabilized over a period of two months. There should be complete rest, no exercise, and some ancillary medication should be given. For example, corticosteroids, then you should also use uh, uh, vasodilators, then positive ionotrophic compounds to increase the heart output. And in addition to that, ivermectin and doxycycline should be given. And then milarosomine treatment should be given. But milarosomine is not available in India. In India, these cases can be treated with the regime which is popularly known as a slow kill method by using ivermectin the rate of 6 microgram per kg on fortnightly basis and it should be given for a period of 6 months along with doxycycline 10 milligrams per kg body weight and it should be given twice a day for 30 days. So that is a slow kill regime which should be given. In addition to that the supportive therapy has to be given which is equally important as the specific chemotherapy. In fact, uh, there are many limitations or lacuna with the specific chemotherapy, and that is why, you know, supportive therapy plays a very important role. You should give products to improve the RBC production and thrombocyte production like B-complex, mineral, then papyrus or papaya leaf extract, which has got a good thrombopyotic activity. And then some of the pet practitioners are also giving human erythropoietin, but I have got my own doubts about the utility of this particular product, particularly when the liver and kidney profiles are normal. Then you should also give uh, fluid therapy uh, because particularly in pyroplasmosis, if there is a hypovolemic shock, then fluid therapy is required. In trypanosomosis, fluid therapy is required because there is hypoglycemia. Liver tonics are required. Antioxidants are required in all canine vector bone diseases. And if you are dealing a case of uh, hepatosome cases, don't forget to use non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug for a prolonged period. In case of emergency, the blood transfusion should be done and uh, corticosteroids should be given. I have seen some of the pet practitioners, uh, they are using corticosteroids quite uh, hurriedly or hastily. That should be avoided because corticosteroids are used in anticipation that the anemia is because of the uh, immunological reaction. That is true, but you need to analyze the hematological picture uh, frequently. And if there is a severe anemia and thrombocytopenia, say thrombocyte count is below 50,000, then you can think of using corticosteroids. So the general recommendations are that, that the corticosteroids should be used only in refractory cases. Because if you use uh, for a prolonged period of time, you know, it increases vulnerability of the host to number of infection and it also avoids the clearing of the organisms by the chemotherapy. The chemotherapeutic agents are required for clearing of the organisms, but the competence of the immune system is equally important. And that is why corticosteroids should not be used hurriedly or hastily. Uh, I would like to sum up on uh, diseases are more common than reported. They are also occurring in a subclinical form and that make the area and
the most important problem the pet practitioners are facing that they don't know about the endemicity of their region to different uh, canine vector bone diseases. So the basic research or a survey is necessary. As I've said, uh, at least on a couple of occasions that symptoms and hematobiochemical are not uh, indicative of the species involved in the infection and which is very necessary to identify because the drugs may be same, but the treatment regime may differ. Then conventional methods lack sensitivity, immunodiagnostic kits lack specificity or accuracy, and molecular techniques lack feasibility. The treatment options are also limited. The complete elimination may not be achieved, and that is why there are frequent relapses. Then prolonged support is very important. Continuous monitoring of the case is very important. The owners should be, you know, informed about the situation of the CBBD. And in this situation, what I feel that the control of vector is very, key, uh, very important. It is the key using acaricides to control ticks. Nowadays, you know, newer and newer formulations are available in the market. And it has to be, you know, based on control of uh, vector so that there will be control of uh, tick bone diseases or fly bone diseases. So in my talk, you must have realized the number of knowledge gaps. Uh, at present, uh, we don't have a reliable, feasible, and affordable diagnostic method. Maybe, you know, a method which will discriminate uh, different uh, infections with uh, one application. Then we should have a drug which is 100% efficacious to eliminate the organism. Uh, people are trying on uh, nanotechnology so that the dose can be reduced the frequency of administration can be reduced. As far as vaccine development, Dr. Singla has also spoke about vaccine development. It is in a very primitive stage as far as the uh, vector bone infections are concerned. And now the recent concept is that it is not only the control of vector bone infection, it should be comprehensively tackled with the control of vectors also. So in case of malaria, people are working on the development of the malarial parasite in the body of mosquito. So somewhat similar approach is required for control of these vectors as well as vector bone diseases. These are some of my references. Uh, and thank you very much uh, for uh, your time and extremely sorry for the initial delay. And if you have got any questions or queries, please ask. I don't claim to have a complete knowledge on the topic, but I will try my best to answer your queries, if not immediately, by referring to the literature and via email or via phone. We can be in touch. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Hello, sir. Sir, can Hello. you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. I can see you. So there is a few questions from the participant side, sir. Yeah. How can we control flea infestation in dogs? Sorry? How can we control flea infestation in dogs? Flea infestation can be controlled by various ways. Uh, one yes. must understand that when there are when there are few fleas on the body, there are 95% of the stages present, 95% uh, of the stages present in the Premises. So, the effort should be taken to control the stages in the premises. Nowadays, there are so many insect growth regulators are available and easy to apply formulations are available. For example, s methoprene is used to control the fleas. And this is an insect growth regulator which, uh, which prevents the development of the pupil stage to the adult stage. That is how the fleas can be controlled. Can be controlled mechanically by simply using the vacuum cleaner. With the vacuum cleaner, all the stages can be withdrawn in the back of the vacuum cleaner, and then that yeah. can be disinfected. Yeah, huh. over to you, Harana. Okay, sir. The next question is, sir. Um, uh, I am dealing with cats uh, mostly found uh, mycoplasm like structure, mycoplasm hemophilus, without any clinical yeah. symptom. Uh, sir, uh, what is your uh, question? What precautionary measure that will be taken for this? Uh, mycoplasma, in my clinical experience, may not be uh, you know reflected in the literature. 
what I feel, mycoplasma are basically complicating yes, organism. Very rarely you see a pure infection of mycoplasma hemocanus or hemobartinella species. And uh, that can be tackled with oxytetracycline or doxycycline. Oh, yeah. And mycoplasma is transmitted by ticks. So the basic key is control of vectors so that the infection cannot be transmitted. Over to you, Dr. Maharana. Okay, sir. Now, this is a very good question, sir. Hello, hello, hello. Hello. Sir, is there any reports of drug resistant in canines? Drug resistance against, uh, against ticks or uh, against the uh, uh, organisms? Sir, against ticks. Okay. Ticks. Sorry? Ticks, sir. Ticks. Sir. ticks. Uh, yes. As far as the acaricide resistance is concerned against the ticks, uh, particularly rificiferous uh, Hello. I haven't come hello. across any references regarding acaricide resistance, but there are many indirect uh, uh, mentions in the literature that uh, this rificiferous sanguinous is developing resistance against some of the old acaricides like organochlorines and organophosphorus compounds. Over to you, Dr. Maharana. What is the best uh, deworming schedule for dog and cats? <laughs> See, uh, best deworming schedule for dogs and cats. Uh, if you go through the literature, you will find that the major problem is faced by the puppies because of the lactogen <laughs> infection and uh, transuterine infection, particularly Toxogara canis. And uh, the adult worms develop in the small intestine at the age of four weeks or five weeks. So the most important thing is to uh, deworm the, uh, at the age of four to five weeks. Pyrantel is, uh, sorry, piprazine is a drug of choice for these ascarid worms. But there are certain side effects. So piprazine can be used under, under when the case is monitored properly to eliminate these adult worms. The adult worms keep coming in the intestine because there is a tracheal route of migration. So this uh, deworming should be done at least on a monthly basis. Over to you, Dr. Maharana. Okay, so the next question is, uh, particular region, why prevalence of Babesia gibsoni is increasing, sir? Uh, Babesia gibsoni, yes, I missed that particular uh, point because it was in the initial plate of uh, presentation and I was not very comfortable. So, uh, Babesia gibsoni, in addition to vector bone infection, it is also transmitted mechanically, particularly during dog fights. During dog fights, you must have observed that they lock jaw and there is a bleeding from gums. And that is how the infection is transmitted. Even the infection can be transmitted through needles, through blood transfusion. And I have seen a couple of references indicating a vertical transmission of Babesia gibsoni, although the scientific community has not authenticated this mode of uh, transmission. Over to you, Dr. Maharana. Sir, actually, one practical ask this question, sir. How can you control uh, hair fall from the, in the in canines? Particularly? Hair fall. Uh, 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 there is a, see, for dermatological case, you, if you go to the part of India, 30% of the cases in the canine practice are dermatological cases or the skin diseases. And there are extrinsic factor as well as intrinsic factor. And parasites uh, are responsible, fungus, viruses, bacteria are responsible. Certain metabolic diseases are also uh, responsible like hypothyroidism, diabetes mellitus. So there are a number of reasons. I cannot, uh, you know, tell you one particular solution for stopping the hair fall. You need to find out what is the reason for the hair fall and then accordingly treat the animal. Over to Dr. Maharana. Okay, sir. The next question is, sir, is there any ethno veterinary practice against uh, pyroplasmosis in Tane? I have no idea. Oh. I have no, I have no idea about this because. Uh, I have my own reservations as far as the herbal products are concerned. Because yes, herbal products uh, do have activity against number of parasites. The literature is flooded with number of references. But uh, the quality control is a big problem. You know, how you can ensure that the active ingredient in each batch of, uh, you know, medicine, commercial batch of medicine, the active ingredient is in the same proportion. That is a big question. And that is why I have got my own reservations as far as the herbal products are concerned. Over to you, Dr. Maharana. 
Okay, the next question is uh, do anti parasitic drugs interfere with the development of immunity against uh, that particular pyroclasm? Come again, I can't hear you properly. Sir, do anti pyroclasmic drugs interfere with development of immunity against particular pyroclasm? In <laughs> sir, it's a very good question, particularly in case of Babesha Kipsoni. Because Babesha vogeli, which is a large pyroplasm, is not of a major concern. Only in young hosts, there is a problem. Once you know that uh, critical threshold age is crossed by the dog, then it will give a persistent uh, anemia, hemolytic picture. But Babesha gibsoni is more pathogenic. Now, as I've said during my presentation, that 100% elimination from the body of the host is not achieved by any of the drugs available today. So low level of parasitemia is maintained in the body and that is responsible for the existence of pre-immunity. And in fact, you know, that is like a blessing in disguise that this low level can, you know, give protection for the massive challenges subsequently. But as I've said, it also acts as a source of infection for the vectors to spread the infection in that particular area and then the area may become endemic. Over to you, Dr. Maharana. Uh, sir, uh... Last two questions, sir. Sir, okay. um, is it compulsory that every vaccination deworming is a must, especially, especially in adult dogs? Uh, uh, yes, uh, you know, deworming should be done because adult dogs, okay, adult dogs cannot have a toxocara infection, particularly the pet dogs because of the age. But uh, uh, the adult dogs can have certain other infections like hookworms. Adult dogs can have uh, tapeworm infections like Dipalidium caninum. Hookworm, the life cycle can be completed in three weeks. Dipalidium caninum, the life cycle can be completed in 50 days. So there may be recurrent uh, infections and one wouldn't know whether the animal is infected with the worms or not. So it is better to deworm whenever the vaccination is done. As it is, you know, in adult dogs, the vaccination is the annual uh, program. So, you can deworm, say, about 7 to 15 days prior to vaccination. Over to you, Dr. Maharana. Sir, the last question is, sir, what do you suggest as the best funding agency for bringing projects in control of parasites, particularly in canine cell? <laughs> I, <laughs> uh, I have commented that way, you know, during that particular slide, because we have approached, you know, I have approached uh, DST and DBT at least uh, three to four occasions, you know, with uh, very good projects on uh, uh, companion animals or the companion animal parasites. But, you know, all these projects were turned down. You know, uh, I was not even invited to, you know, uh, for the interview where I can explain my concern. But that was my experience. Maybe, you know, you have to try, try and keep trying. <laughs> Thank you. Over to you, Dr. Maharana. Okay, okay sir. Since, since sir, appreciation for the outstanding presentation, sir. The slide Thank you very close, much. Close look at the real image of uh, Canon Hector 1 DGS that you could not have gained in any other way, sir. Thank you so much for sharing your time and experience with us, sir. Now, over My to pleasure. Sir, My pleasure. Now, over to Snail uh, for uh, giving you a vote of thanks, Dr. F. Katne, sir. A very good afternoon, everyone. It is an honor for me to express gratitude towards Dr. Gatme, who wholeheartedly joined our invitation for the webinar series. It is a teacher like you who freely give up their valuable time and ensure that the next generation is better informed and educated. You have touched upon several critical areas of the canine web. Thank you, sir, for helping us to become more aware of the canine vector bone problem and the way to solve them in a holistic manner. Thank you once again, sir, for your stimulating and enthusiastic presentation. Your talk will definitely provide much needed help to the budding parasitologist and field veterinarian. Sir, we extend our sincere appreciation for your outstanding presentation. Your message was exactly what we need to hear. You have raised an important issue of scarcity of government funding in the canine research. We all hope that the problem will be well addressed in the future. Thank you again, sir, for sharing your valuable knowledge and experience. Once again, thanks a lot, sir. My pleasure, uh, my pleasure. One important notice for tomorrow, the webinar 
resume tomorrow at 9:30 a.m. the lecture of Dr. Shri Kumar uh, on wildlife parasite and Dr. Sanjay Kumar on equine pyroplasmosis. Thanks once again all the participants who have joined with us. Thank you.